welcome to Teachers Teaching Teachers. It is um, September 17th, 2014, and we are here to reconnect, rethink, re uh, make some new walking teams. I don't know what we're doing. Learn about um, Out of Eden Learn, Out of Eden Walk Learn. Um, Paul Solopnik, if I get the name right, is that close? Um, is uh, Has been walking for, I don't know, what is it? 18 months now? Something mm -hmm. like that? Yeah. Um, more. And is it more than that? Mm -hmm. uh, A year and three quarters. Okay, great. Uh, yeah, so, um, and we have somebody who is helping to organize curriculum with Project Zero. You can kind of describe them better for us. Um, and a couple of teachers who have been messing with this. I messed with it um, last mm -hmm. spring, messed with it. I had uh, some of my 6th and 7th graders um, on. We only got through like a couple of the footsteps, i got to say, but, um, you know, that was fun. And so we want to talk about relaunching this, reconnecting, and um, why don't we start with introductions. Um, Liz, why don't you introduce yourself first, if you would. Sure, yeah. Hi, everybody. I'm uh, Liz Dawes de Rising. I'm based at Project Zero, which is a research group at the Harvard Graduate School of Education. And I've been uh, working on the Out of Eden Learn project since the beginning and, in fact, helped to um, conceptualize and start it. Um, I'm very happy to explain what it is and why we're doing it in a moment, but maybe everybody else would like to introduce themselves first. Sounds good. Is it Jenny or Jennifer? Go ahead. I go by Jennifer, but okay, um, Jennifer. Good. I teach uh, high school. I teach juniors mostly at Crystal Lake in Crystal Lake at Prairie Ridge High School in Illinois, and I did Project Eden Learn with my students, my juniors last year, and it was a unique experience for me because I'm not very tech savvy, so it was really interesting to see how the kids just kind of zapped on into this online learning opportunity. It was really cool. Mm. cool. So you'll get to tell us more, too. Thank you for coming. And from South Florida, I think, Tabitha. Oh, yes. Hi. Um, I'm Tabitha. I teach elementary school. And I've. this is going to be the second year that we started um, a walking party. Um, the last two years, um, I taught fourth grade, and my fourth graders joined with the Added Eden Learn. And this year, um, I'm overseeing grades three, four, and five, and two fifth grade teachers are going to be starting in walking parties. So I'm excited to help them get that started this year. Yeah. Hey, w will some of those students be repeating? I'm, I'm at a different school, so okay. they're going to be no, brand, new school, um, brand new students doing it this time. But I'm oh, hoping that last year's students are continuing it. I try to encourage them to do that over the summer. So. Yeah, that's one of my questions. I, like half of my students will re be repeating and half not, so figuring that out will be interesting. And then Thomas, do you want to introduce yourself? Um, yeah, so um, I'm Thomas Scamelli. I'm the uh, Director of Academic Technology and Innovation at uh, GEMS World Academy, which is part of the GEMS Education Group, um, consortium of schools worldwide. And uh, I am, I've been a uh, high school teacher uh, all the way to pre-service uh, education teacher uh, or, or, or adjunct. Um, and uh, we, we have a focus of the school that's very much about uh, building global citizenship through um, uh, translocal connections and exploring the city as a landscape for learning. So we're already two weeks in uh, doing lots of walking um, and mobile learning projects on a daily basis, and it's uh, this this project uh, popped into my Tumblr stream actually, and I've known Paul for a while, and got very interested. And we actually have a fourth grade and a fifth grade, and possibly a sixth grade uh, group that are interested in joining in any way that they can. So I'm here to learn. So your new school, you're starting with what grades? Or are you starting with all of them? So we we are PK PK six. Mm -hmm. um, Core is primary years program. Uh, then we'll add our uh, upper middle school next year, and then we'll add the the high school the year the year after. Cool. And it's in Chicago, is it? Or yeah, so Lakeshore East. So we're right uh, uh, two blocks from Millennium Park, um, block and a half from the the waterfront. 
Right. Very cool. So, Liz, that's us. Um, do you want to start us off a little bit? Um, I, I, you suggested some questions. You know, here's what I already suggested one question. Um, how do we reconnect? How do we get started again? Um, how are walking parties getting formed? Those are some of the questions. But going back beyond that, I'm really interested in some of the theory too, like what the slow stuff is really interesting, and I'm working with a brand new uh, social studies teacher who wants to know is this history. So there's a few questions. <laughs> Great. Um, I'm wondering <laughs> whatever you like place. there. Jump in, yeah. <laughs> okay. um, I'm wondering though, just in case there are people watching who really don't know what Out of Eden Learn is, I think the first place to start is to say a little bit about Paul Salapak and the Out of Eden walk um, so, so that people have got a bit of background to this. Um, so here at Project Zero we're, we're collaborating with uh, a journalist, a Pulitzer Prize winning journalist, um, Paul Salapak, and in January 2013 he set off from Hurtoburi in um, Ethiopia um, so from a site that's very rich in our ancient ancestors' you know, hominid fossils, and set out on a seven-year walk around the world. And the reason for his project, which is totally, you know, precedes anything we were doing, is to experiment with slow journalism. And by that he means really the kind of journalism that's a counterpoint to 24-hour news, news flashes, tweets, you know, the busy busyness of, of today's news. And to kind of go at a more human pace, to walk between stories, to kind of get, take really the pulse of what's happening in the world instead of jetting in and out of stories. And he was a foreign correspondent in Africa for many years, so it so definitely knows that side of the business. And then another premise of his walk is that he's broadly following the migratory pathways of our ancient human ancestors, hence the walk starting in Ethiopia. And uh, he walked up um, from there to Djibouti, um, walked up the western um, coast of Saudi Arabia through the Hejaz and has a very nice piece in the July edition of National Geographic based on that leg of the walk. He walked on up through Jordan into Israel, spent time in the West Bank literally weeks if not days before the conflict started there in, over the summer. Um, he then has had to change his route somewhat because of the terrible conflict that's happening in the Middle East took a ferry to Cyprus, walked across Cyprus, and he's currently somewhere in eastern Turkey. His exact whereabouts, unknown, um, because for security reasons we don't know his exact coordinates. Um, but yeah, he's walking up through eastern Turkey, kind of heading up towards the Caucasus region. So that's Paul Salapak. He writes regular dispatches for the National Geographic website, which are really beautiful dispatches. Um, um, what he's seeing, what he's been talking to, what he's thinking about. And they really weave together history, his careful observations, um, interviews, etc. And then there are these longer form pieces. And if you were to, to look it up, he's had pieces on NPR, New York Times, this kind of thing. So all of that, frankly, even if you don't get involved with us, is a wonderful resource for teachers. I, I think it's fair to say. Um, and Liz, um, can, I, yeah. can I, as yeah. an example of interrupting, and everyone, please interrupt as we go here. Um, those, the, the dispatches, I think, are beautiful and wonderful, too. Um, I was wondering how the elementary school teachers, I, I guess, Tabitha, but, um, deal with the, I mean, those are pretty difficult texts on some yeah. level. It seems to me. Yeah. yeah. Um, we, yeah. I do a lot of um, paraphrasing and, and retelling the stories and, and pulling out um, the really poignant parts of the um, pieces. They definitely have to be um, read first before you read them out loud to the students um, because they are written for adults. But um, there's, the language is so rich and the way he writes is just um, the students are getting a lot yeah. out of it. So it's um, the stories. He adds um, video clips into um, the dispatches as well as sound bites. And 
So, that's so that the, context helps yeah. you understand the text. So oh, absolutely, mm -hmm. yes. And, and I, I've got a bit to say about how we're making the dispatches accessible, but Jennifer, mm -hmm. do you want to share how you've used the, the dispatches with high school students? With the high school students, you know, their, their writing voice is very much that academic voice of, you know, very structured and organized. So we look at his, um, his, his word choice, his sentence fluency, and work on ways for students to kind of model sentence structure and the use of, of his descriptive words to bring out emotions in their own writing. So we use Paul's dispatches not only in terms of what is he doing, where is he going, but how is he able to evoke from us, the readers, his passion and his excitement for what he's doing through his word choice? So I, I couldn't think of anything better to help model for students what true writing voice is, especially because so many students are like, oh, I want to be a writer. And I don't think they really get what it really is to be a successful writer. So then when they can see the actual journalist out there in the field doing it, the aha moment kind of happens. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I, so I think, you know, a few teachers have used his work as actual text in the classroom and we're interested in, in looking at that. But uh, we, as part of our relaunch, so this is a good cue for me, we mm -hmm. have, um, we got feedback from educators and, and, and students and students actually told us they want to read the original. So they're very drawn to, you know, the kind of the authentic nature of the dispatches and Paul's writing is very poetic and evocative. Mm -hmm. But, you know, clearly it is quite difficult. So what but, we've but done... Not, not very lengthy, that's one of the good things, too. Yeah, really. no, that's true. That They've got that going on. Well, um, yeah. But what we've done is develop this... Uh, th students now can choose whether they read them on the dispatches on the website through our curriculum or we've created what we call annotated dispatches and this is a simple editor tool that our web developers built for us and so um, some kind of tr maybe tricky conceptual phrases or references or just sheer vocabulary we've grayed them out and if you put the cursor over them a box will pop up with some explanatory text mm. Um, so we're, we'll see how those go, but um, I got some positive feedback on the weekend when I, I shared them out, and Paul has seen them and likes them. Um, to be fair to Paul, he was even open to us doing write, rewriting junior versions of his writing, which kind of filled me with a bit of trepidation, because it's a bit hard to, uh, to kind of rewrite uh, somebody's really fantastic writing. But I, I think this solution is, is good. I, we'll see if it works. We'll get feedback from students. But they, they're able to engage with the real text, but then you know, there is some scaffolding and support. Um, because if there's a teacher like Tabitha who can facilitate and summarize and you know, help kids understand, that's great. Uh, we do know, for example, in middle school classes, sometimes kids are working more independently, and this would kind of allow them to navigate a bit more by themselves. So, yeah. yeah. So let me just, um, one of the things um, I, I'm totally fascinated by social reading and online reading and, and annotation sites. So um, I, I've thrown some of his dispatches up into now comment, and kids have um, done their own annotations of text. Um, so that's another kind of possibility f um, that we've played with. And, and recently been fascinated by Genius, you know, which is. Uh, a more generic version of Rap Genius, and you, it would be interesting to see if, you know, some of us could could throw his dispatches up there and see what kinds of annotations could build around them there too. Yeah, we have had actually had this idea because there was this debate. You know, we're trying to make this a student-centered community. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, can we create opportunities where students themselves and educators are annotating them? Um, and it would be great if you could share in our, in, we have a forum there, um, some of the links mm -hmm. to, to what you've yep. used. And, and we may play around with that. I will be honest, we do have a few copyright issues with National Geographic that we have to be mm -hmm. mindful of. And mm -hmm. they've given us permission to reproduce um, kind of, I think we, I think the ballpark figure is 10 um, dispatches for this coming year in that way. And we have to be careful about, you know, the photographs in particular. Um, that said, Paul, after a certain amount of time, has the copyright to his own writing and he's very cool with, you know, kids um, interacting with the text writing on it, etc. in this context anyway. So I think, you know, that's 
it's great that you've already been doing it because we, we could learn from how that went and, and what you found useful, I think. Um, again, if we keep it contained on our site and it's not a complete free for all where we're just shoving out National Geographic content all around the world, so yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. So, uh, anybody have any further questions on this circle, uh, this topic around reading and the dispatches, or any thoughts, so questions? We're going to move into we'll, we'll move into the um, the the walking the walking pieces. I mean, I'm very very interested in in that. Where when I look through this your your curriculum, it's 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 exactly what we're what we're actually doing. Uh, with with our kids from from kindergarten on, and so the chance to um, have a, a project that is 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 ready made to not only have social impact but also uh, be purposefully connected to other classrooms throughout the world um, is I think very very fascinating, and um, so I would love to hear more about how that aspect worked. Um, or work. So Thomas, you can, you say, can you say, you've been open for two weeks, you said, can, can you uh, give us a little picture of what you've done that's yeah, related so, to this? Yeah, yeah so, um, you know, we started in the summer with uh, Explorer Camps where we were, we were really um, doing derives, very much um, at an academic level, looking at, at uh, much of what psychogeographers did as we tried to map um, our, the, the local community that, that uh, is Lakeshore East. Um, moving through with with iPads and doing everything from, uh, you know, uh, interest-based, um, you know, observation and uh, whether participant or, or or environmental observation, to um, the roots of, of participant observation, uh, some free form, but you know, forming questions and and collecting data, uh, and and looking at that data, and um, you know, that's sort of like the the big scatter shot. Then as we've started in the first couple of weeks, it's been a it's been a very fascinating um, field studies program to watch unfold. In that, the kindergarten teachers are teaching the rest of the school, um, you know, things about how to appropriately pack up and have agency in the field uh, when we're going to be extended. All of our teachers are expected to be out um, for four hours minimum per week, and so how kids are given agency to actually uh, go out prepared understand that they're prepared, wear their own backpacks sometimes for the first time, um, what it means to to walk across the landscape, perhaps make a map themselves off of, of you know where they want to go ahead of time or just look at the map and, and see where they're going to go. To um, you know the, the sixth graders who have jumped right into the roots of the Phone Our, Phone Our Nation project, which I, I'm pretty sure um, Paul you know you know about John Worth's work. With Phonar, I'm not sure. Go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So uh, much like DS 106, um, okay. you know, so um, uh, an activist based course uh, um, that is uh, photo light perspective based. Um, so that moving into their their PYP uh, curriculum, uh, you know, all of these field studies, and so in their essential agreements, they call them. They're they're working on how we. You know, how we live in the world, who we are, uh, and then they're starting to tie these field studies uh, into that. The art teacher is using uh, paper by 53 in the field um, and pencils to you know, uh, draw the world in multiple different lenses for different classes. Um, they are going out doing sensory mashups. Um, you know, so the, the first graders, I don't mean to keep talking, but it's been <laughs> unbelievable. The first graders have been out um, really looking at play and the landscape of a city. Um, so almost uh, Colin Ward-esque exploding school type stuff going on without it being that sort of radical tinge. Uh, but they're, they're looking at what it means to play outside of school but still be in school. Um, and then they're comparing that globally with different, uh, different schools already connecting about what play looks like in Switzerland in Africa and different places, and so that's just a couple of the different things you know wow. that are. Yeah. are um, can I just ask how how are you connecting? Are you using something like flat classroom, or how are you connecting with schools in Switzerland? What's your mechanism? 
so so the mechanism right now is, is what we're in what we are in in Google Hangouts and then connections through our gems network um, we've started a couple of other uh, preliminary connections uh, from you know my network and others networks um, you know with schools in Brasilia and, and a couple of others and so um, as far as an enterprise system we do have a, a, you know an LMS canvas that is rolled out that we can bring others into um, but we're really at this point skirting flat classroom uh, I'm a huge fan of taking uh, or you know, TIG um, and we'll see how that might work in the, in the lower school but yours would be really the first sort of full-scale platform that we would move into um, and it seems like that student-centric view is, uh, is at the center of the projects which is probably the most important thing for us is that the students have active engagement in, in any any projects that we're doing and um, the teachers can really can be there to support so yes. well Liz you grab it back if you can <laughs> but yeah <laughs> I mean I, the, the thing is what, what what I'm curious about is how you when you hear s something like this school happening um, and then there are other schools where it's really hard to get the kids out of the building right um, your curriculum certainly opens the doors um, in lots of ways. Do you want to kind of break mm -hmm. down um, how that's how the footsteps are working? Or Yeah, no, because I, I feel like we talked about what Paul's doing, but I haven't really laid out, you know, what, right, yeah. what our companion education site is. Um, and I'll also say now that the Pulitzer Center for Crisis Reporting, they have some resources on their website too. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, ours is the companion website that's very interactive and connects kids. Um, but I just wanted, you know, to point out that we're not we're not the only people who are engaged in out of Eden le a walk. Um, so it's in, it's just interesting hearing about your project, which is very much about going out and walking. And I've I've been talking actually recently with some. Um, other educators, Dan Kinzer, I don't know if, if any of you have come across him, for example. Um, and this might be an aspect of Out of Eden Learn that we develop further in the future. But for now, um, there is a slight walk element to what we do, but um, it's more... Out of Eden Learn is working on a slightly more conceptual level, I would say, in that we're trying to emulate Paul's way of being in the world and his disposition towards learning and listening and, and looking as much as it is about, we're not kind of doing expeditionary education or wilderness education, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. That's not to say there isn't a role for it in Out of Eden Learn. There could be, but at the moment that's not been our focus. Um, so the background to this, I think it might be helpful to see what the kind of the DNA of our project is a bit. So I myself was um, a high school history teacher for eight years and I've recently done my um, doctorate at the Ed School and been involved with Project Zero for many years. And what I bring to the project is really an interest in how young people connect their lives to bigger stories, a bigger history you could call it or it could be how they situate themselves in the world and so that was a very natural tie-in with what Paul's journalism is about and I'd also had a pilot um, study which connected schools in Australia, Canada and the US getting them to think about their personal connections to the past, comparing perspective, see how living in one country might really affect how you think about history, getting kids to interview somebody from a different generation to see how their relationship to the past might be different. So that's the piece that I, when I met Paul, who was here at Harvard, I was kind of coming into it from that angle. Meanwhile, um, Shari Tishman, who's a fellow PI on the project, she has a long history of promoting slow looking. Uh, she's done a lot of work in museums and with art educators and, and really Project Zero as a whole and, and we've been around for close to 50 years um, particularly well known for the work of Howard Gardner and David Perkins. There's been a real history of arts education getting kids to slow down, to have deeper learning experiences. And so that's kind of infused in our project as well and is another natural synergy between Paul's disposition as a journalist and what we value as educators at Project Zero. 
And then the third peer principal investigator is Carrie James. And I'll just give a little plug that she has a great book coming out in a couple of weeks. Um, and she specializes in kids' online lives, so you know, how they use digital media. She's particularly interested in the ethics of that and how they interact and their social engagement. And so she's brought her lens to bear in that we're trying to create an online setting that that is really differentiates itself from say Facebook or Snapchat and um, we're we're getting kids to connect with one another but we're trying to create a really safe space and piloted this fall we have um, a new um, dialogue toolkit which will try and provide some scaffolding for kids to really go a little bit deeper in their interactions with one another so those are really where we're coming from and then um, the goals of Out of Eden Learn, which we revised over time because it was very much an experimental thing when we set off, we're emphasizing um, inviting kids to look slowly, to listen carefully. So we've got this big theme of slow, uh, which matches up with Paul's work. We've got and the which, idea. Which also, can, can I just, I mean, yeah, of course. It, it can also connect to like slow food, it can, I mean slow, you, there are, there's a lot of slow, right? I mean, Yeah, so but, I would say we, we haven't invented obviously this concept, it's a bit, yeah. you know, the zeitgeist, I think mindfulness, um, which you're seeing cropping up everywhere, um, mm -hmm. that, that's kind of related, although not, you know, how we framed it. And I will say that the fact that our project's taking place right now, um, re it's really significant because we weren't sure how receptive kids would be to the concept and honestly we've been blown away by how excited young people are by this whole idea of slowing down kind of very going very low tech just taking a walk in their neighborhood documenting it listening to an older person I mean I'm sure um, Tabitha could share anecdotes about her stu uh, students and, and, and also Jennifer their students have responded really positively to this and I think it's a sign of the times that a lot of kids are maybe a bit over scheduled and busy there's you know stuff coming at them from all angles and actually slowing down is a novelty in our day and age I mean it would have been part so, of everyday life a few generations back and that's not the case now so so um, there's a lot to, a lot more to, for you to say now but let's see if Jennifer and, and Tabitha yeah. have a riff on slow and or whatever else you've heard here for a second. Yeah. Okay. Um, um, go ahead, Tabitha. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, I just when one of the footsteps is slowing down and interviewing and um, an older person, and they really got into that where they had to really listen to what these older people were saying, and as they would stop and and take the time to really listen, they found that they would get more of the story and they would get more in depth and more involved. So that was. Um, that was one of the the big things that they um, learned with from Paul is that the way that you question too, and it's it's asking the right questions and really taking the time to try to understand what the person is saying. So their communication skills improved. Can you be like? Do you remember what those questions? I mean, he asked three questions when he gets anywhere, right? And did you just bounce um, off those? Is that right? Um, we did. I mean, and that's part of the footsteps that it that it mm -hmm. talks about. Um, that's that's set up for with the Out of Eden Learn platform. But um, it's um, I, I I have several short stories. I mean, from the kids, from what they found out. But um, so, go ahead, Jennifer. Go ahead. I. <laughs> Well, I mean, I could piggyback off of you for that um, one footstep, too. My students, um, grad their high school English students, and they really, like, they so wanted to ask somebody random. I'm like, go to the bookstore. That's where old people like to hang out. And you don't think, well, maybe we'll take a field trip. You know, the I'm old getting nervous people. about what old means here. I, <laughs> I know. I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I just Over 50. <laughs> and then yeah. they went back to their comfort level, and they went to grandma and grandpa and everything like that. Mm -hmm. And but the feedback from that was like, I've never had that kind of talk with my grandmother or grandfather before. It's like it brought a, a stronger bond between, and knowing the background to their grandparents really helped them understand their own parents and the decisions they've made in raising them as kids and teenagers. And it was like 
that epiphany moment of, wow, I've never really thought of it like that before. So the interview one really did go over much better than I thought because I honestly thought that they'd be like, oh, this is going to take time. I don't really want to listen to somebody else. But they really did. And my students also just like the element of being able to stop and think because they are so forced to think in the way we want them to think because schools are so driven by test scores now that it was so nice for them just to sit back and reflect to make meaning out of what they were thinking about instead of somebody kind of saying, well, you have to think this way for this type of meaning. And this year, when you brought up what are Paul's three questions for his milestones, he asks, well, I, th I think it's like, who are you, or what is your name, where are you going, where are you from, and where are you going? And this year, I plan to kind of incorporate such a, such a milestone project with my kids as well, where, you know, every day or maybe once or twice a week, you know, they have to take their 100 steps, and who have they met in the hallway, who have they met at the grocery store, and I'm not quite sure how I'll set it up in terms of, you know, them talking to strangers, like this is kind of weird type of thing, but I think it's interesting that they still, like Paul, go outside their own comfort zone and are exposing themselves to those other types of people outside their social circles because teenagers can become very clicky. Mm -hmm. yeah. I might just add to that, that was just an example of how we've obviously set up this basic framework, the curriculum, the space, but then we really found that teachers innovate. They come up, you know, how it's, we've, you know, we haven't thought to do that, and we're really hoping that this year we've got a, a space where teachers can post kind of things they've tried out, um, resources, um, and that's exactly the kind of thing that another school might want to try and run with. Um, and I, I guess we didn't mention before that besides the National Geographic website, um, the Knight Foundation has a website where Paul documents the walk, and that's where all the maps are and these milestones where he does and takes um, sort of videos, which he calls glances, and pictures of the sky and, his, and the ground. And then a very, very cool feature which is done in collaboration with Madame, which is fairly. Yeah, we're, we're losing. We're losing every other word. But keep. Oh, where's keep the, going. We, I, you, you, you'll come back. You were talking about. Are you there, Liz? Still. I can hear you. Yeah. Okay, you're good. You're good again. You were talking about the um, all the things he did, all the all the kind of amazing I don't know art projects almost he does, um, and we missed some of that. The photos, Liz. It used yeah. to, we're going in and, and out. The videos, yeah. Yeah. Well, Tabitha, do you want is, Tabitha? Can you explain the milestones then, in case mm -hmm. I'm my connections? Oh, not you're good. good. Yeah. Okay. Um, just when he reaches a hundred, every hundred miles, he'll stop and he'll take a picture of the sky, and the ground, and then he'll do a panoramic, and um, so it's documenting that. And he will interview the first person that he sees. That mm -hmm. those questions. Yeah, and then the the idea is that there'll be you know over time this is an amazing resource in that it's like this um, string of pearls of faces around the world. Um, Kind of documenting different ways of life, and in our um, in our footsteps, we actually have a new one that we've um, that we've um, created for the fall. Really, getting um, young people to try and and take on board, um, maybe taking a slow video if they want to do that, or really looking at. Um, how something is done in their community. Like Paul has some beautiful. Um, um, explanatory slideshows or videos of, for example, how to make a water cooler in the desert or how to brew coffee with Bedouin people in Saudi Arabia. These kind of things which are every day for the people who are there and getting kids to realize that the things they take for granted around them might be intrinsically very interesting to somebody else who doesn't know the way of doing something in their own community. So we, we are kind of trying to build off that aspect of Out of Eden Walk this fall. So, yeah. uh, so, so I'm wondering, I, I'm sitting here thinking that it would be really easy to take a riff uh, and lose the community 
you know, my worry about that. So, so how do you, how do teachers like innovate and iterate on the footsteps that you guys have provided and so forth, but still yeah, stay, maybe I, I still look. say stay in the same ballpark. <laughs> yeah, that's a great question, and I also should probably just explain in a few lines how it works. So, it's free of charge. Um, people can sign up around the world. They register on our website, and we group classes together. So, a class could be a homeschool with one or two kids, or it could be as large as forty kids in in some countries where the classes are bigger. And we purposefully put together groups, which we call walking parties, to go with the walking metaphor. Um, and we try to make those as diverse as we can, geographically, but also socioeconomically. Um, so, I mean, we we get teachers to kind of write a bit of a description about what their schools are like, so that um, kids from different walks of life are also encountering one another. And and that's very deliberate because um, a lot of writers. Um, like Ethan Zuckerman, for example, have written about the echo chamber effect of the internet, like finding like, people flocking together. And although young people can be very active online, it's often with people who are very similar to themselves. So like a huge potential of our website is to get them to exchange perspectives with people who might be different. And I could um, add, and then, uh, if we could add to that the echo chamber of our segregated schools too, but I'll just throw that in there for a second. In, in that, you know, the kids in our own schools are, are often, you know, they, they, they look like they're each other <laughs> often. Mm. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah. I think, yeah, uh, I think yeah. it depends. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. Um, so opportunities like this where you get to mix is great. Is yeah, now I will say this has been a challenging piece of our design and it's it, we're kind of experiencing that right now in that we're, by making it free for everybody, um, there's a slightly random effect. And so, um, for example, right now we have huge numbers of middle school classes from the United States eager to go, ready to sign up, and we just do not have very many, we have a few, but we really don't have a match in terms of the numbers of middle schools from other parts of the world to match mm -hmm. them with. I mean, it looks better at the elementary school level and the high school level. So there's a certain randomness to this where we can't guarantee who you're going to end up with, and we're scrambling right now to really try and get more schools from China on board, for example, um, um, because the, you know, the Part of the excitement of this is that you are put with students really who are living very different lives. Um, and another piece looking forward, although we're not there yet, is at the moment it's all in English. So that by you know necessity, you know, cuts out um, um, great waves of people. But moving forward, we're looking to make the platform multilingual. And um, actually I just heard from Paul Salopak this week. A National Geographic are pushing ahead with their translations because they've been a little bit slow on that. So Spanish and Chinese are going to be the first priority in translating all of Paul's dispatches. And actually, uh, Vincent, who works with me um, here at Project Zero, he's just translated all of our educators' materials into Chinese. Mm -hmm. um, because it, it was a bit of a struggle, frankly, for the educators and students who've, who've been involved to date. Um, to, to really grasp it. They're going to be communicating in English. They're doing it in English class, but just having some of the materials there in Chinese is hopefully going to make it a lot easier for them. Um, so yeah, that was about the groupings. Um, and then, yeah, you once you sign up, then the curriculum unfolds, and every two weeks you're going to get um, activities and instructions. This fall, we're structuring it a little bit differently so that there are clearly three parts to any footstep, we call them, but it's like a piece of curriculum. One is engaging with Paul's walk. The other is doing an activity that's somehow related to, to Paul's walk. But the third piece is really taking the time to look at and comment on other students' work. Um, and that was a piece we left a little bit to chance, really, last last year. And I will give you a shout out, Paul. I, I, we particularly noticed that the kids in your class did a phenomenal job on responding to other kids' posts. Um, nice. well, Monte Farmer, in particular, is one of our favorites. <laughs> <laughs> I'll let um, him know. He's. Uh... Yeah, that's funny. 
Yeah. No, um, yeah, well, yeah. you know what? I mean, that comes from years years of working on youth voices, and um, just to to support what you're saying here a little bit, um, you know, we have kids respond four times before they, uh, on average, before they post themselves, right? So, and and we we really kind of really work with how they respond and and comment on each other's stuff um, almost first. But yeah, so I'm glad to hear that. Yeah, and but, Carrie's yeah. been working. She's collaborating with Chris Sloan, who I yeah. know you've worked with in the past. Mm -hmm. um, so this dialogue toolkit, we've really been learning, you know, from some of the work that you've been doing, and some. And then we've got Project Zero thinking routines and other tools that we had up our sleeve to try and, you know, we're really excited about this because I feel like the application of a usable toolkit could, you know, could go well beyond out of Eden Learn. I just feel there's a real need. To skill people up in meaningful interaction online. So, really. uh, when you say safe space, I mean I think we have a sense of what that means. But how are you guys talking, thinking about that? Well, I'll be honest that some some of the way in which we've created it has been somewhat driven by research ethics and the guidelines at, at Harvard and, and other mm -hmm. universities because we do have a research program attached to this that like we want. To Mm. Okay. Research program, yeah, we, we lost Liz at the research program. Um, <laughs> looks like she'll have to rejoin us. Tabitha, Jennifer, do you want to jump in? Or Thomas, go ahead, too. <laughs> yeah. um, can I... Um, Tabitha, you, you, said, you mentioned short stories earlier. Do you want to go there or do you want to go somewhere else? <laughs> um, yeah. The short stories, well, you know, I wanted to, um, if I could just kind of switch gears with Thomas when he was talking about Taking the children out into the community, yeah, go there, out into yeah. the neighborhoods. Um, there is one of the footsteps where you, the children do go out into the neighborhoods, and it's part of the um, the slowing down and mm. really looking at if, what's in their neighborhood, and they take a picture of something. And um, one of the my students um, kind of gave me a hard time about it. She's like, oh, "I've been in my neighborhood. I drive all around my neighborhood. I know everything there is to know about my neighborhood." And then she brings back this amazing photo of this gumbo limbo tree, and she was like, "You were right. We drive by it all the time, but when you know, I had to walk around the neighborhood and really look around. I saw this beautiful tree, and it was just kind of it opened her eyes up. And then they all started sharing about things that everyday objects that they see just took on a whole new meaning for them. So it's it's great that you're already getting them out in the neighborhood and the younger, the kindergarten and first grade, and it's um it really kind of changes their mindset. Yeah, and that's that's in the DNA. The DNA of the school is really uh, about creating the disposition of global nomads and what it means to understand place in the context of translocality. So, you know, what that means to a kindergartner and a sixth grader really deals with many of the things that this project is addressing as far as uh, slowing down, taking close observation. Today they were spending, you know, hours actually looking at uh, you know, uh, uh, patterns within uh, the Lowry Gardens mm -hmm. and um, some of them worked that into the Fibonacci sequence, some of them just spent time watching, you know, bees unfold and, and looking at their landscape with the time to do that and the spaces of permission which will sound very familiar uh, to, to Paul from conversations ago. Um, and so it sounds, uh, you know, it completely as far as philosophy and, and theory and the bigger picture works very well for us. So yeah, um, it, sounds fascinating. Yeah, I think it'll complement it very well what you're already doing. That's, um, well, and, and it certainly provides a landscape. Um, and then we've, we're partnering with schools that may also uh, add to that pool um, so the conversation hopefully continues there, uh, both in Brazil and um, uh, Africa. And and also Europe, Europe. So mm -hmm. to, to see what the need is there, uh, if there is any, to, to expand. But because I think people will be very fascinated uh, when they when they dig into this. Jennifer, did you want to say something? You looked like you did. Oh, I think that one of the most intriguing parts is that element of being able to experience the same sort of lessons curriculum with students of approximately the same age from different cultures because 
we had a school in Massachusetts. Okay, granted that is still America, but you know they had a lake called Crystal Lake in their town. And we're like, oh, we're from Crystal Lake, you know. And it was just that little piece of connection there. And looking at the pictures that were posted, like up in Canada, they didn't know what to expect, but they're like, that just looks like us. And then you get the picture it's from Egypt, and it was like. It didn't everything that they've learned in the textbooks. That's sort of not exactly where what they envisioned and so forth. And it, it really helps put more perspective on the people that they are communicating with. And I really saw um, some of my students who would never share in class. They were my favorite people to read when I would go through all their posting, not just of what they posted, but the thoughtfulness that they posted to others. And I was like, I just wanted to shake them and say, why can't you share this in the classroom? Because you really have so much to offer. So it was a safe, safe space for me, too, where I could say, this is really good, and kind of build them up a little bit. And so later on in, throughout the year, because I had them all year, he, um, this one boy in particular, you know, he did start to open up and he did start to trust his own ideas. So, so many times I feel that, you know, behind that screen, behind that keyboard, they can truly be who they are and they need to understand that it's okay to be who you are in the real world, per se, as well. So that's what I really enjoyed about it, is just to be able to see them grow as people as well as thinkers. Mm -hmm. Some of that's probably different at different ages, too. Yeah. But yeah, yeah, that's really interesting. I mean, Tabitha, I was going to ask you about the, the example of the tree. Did she share that on the site then? And like, what was more important, to bring it back to the class or to share it out to the world? Or um, well, I, I think both. I think, and then just okay. getting the feedback, that was part of it. Um, when you're with the within the walking parties, the other students, I mean, they just, they when they would post things, they wanted those comments back from their peers. I mean that it just um, that's part of like that peer teaching. It just it meant so much more. So um, I, I think it was a little bit of both. Which is why to stay in sync, right? A little bit. So you got anyway. Yeah. Just to address my question earlier, I mean maybe it's just me, but I have to kind of always. Um, hold back on the creative iterations and say, no, but wait, if I do that, then we're not going to get to the next footstep, and then we're going to be out of sync with our walking party. And So, anyway, just to say. I, I, yeah. For us, we, I mean, the pacing was different, and because we, um, we're in South Florida, so we can go outside all year round, and yet we had some walking party members that were in Michigan, and they would be snowbound, so they had to... Um, for a very long time. <laughs> yeah, for a very long time, and they stayed at school for a very long time, too, in the summertime, but um, but it was okay. I mean, we just kind of, um, they, they maybe went ahead, and things that they posted helped us better understand different footsteps as we came up to them. So it seemed to work out okay, but they're putting things in place where you can get in touch with those teachers within your walking party to kind of figure out when your breaks are and vacations and snow days and things like that. Yeah, all that will be good. Um, I really like that they divided this up. You know, I mean, they, they, they seem to have really listened to people and reproduced, mm -hmm. revised the curriculum. It uh, looks pretty clean. I don't know. Yeah. It is. It's exciting. Yeah. It just yeah. the part with the pop-ups over the words and you know helping younger readers understand it. I think I can't. I'm excited to see it. So. And I think the two weeks now between each footstep, it really gives you in the classroom time to sort of reflect. I mean, before it was okay. Here it is. Do it now. We got to post it and move forward again. But now it's like okay. Here it is. Let's think about it. And then you can do it, and then you can even come back as a class and kind of rehash kind of what were the favorite things that you read and so forth, where it becomes more of a learning community than almost something that needs to get done in a certain time frame. Because I truly felt pressured that I was like, oh, my God, we, we got to get this up because people might be waiting for us. And then we were waiting for people, and it kind of spiraled a little bit out of control in my walking party at the end. But I think overall just that whole experience of, of understanding that responsibility that you need to follow through because there are other people who are relying on you to help their own learning experience. Mm -hmm. Jennifer, do you teach um, English? Uh oh, I didn't hear that. I, I said, do you teach English? I do teach English, correct. So, um, how do you help me answer the social studies teacher who says, "Okay, so how am I? How am I? Like so far, we've talked a lot about learning to read and write here. It seems to me, and that's important." Within the context of world culture, you know that's you know no small thing. But is can we make this a valid history um, curriculum, 
or I kind of look. I kind of just look at it as the human story, that element of humanity. You know, what makes us people in terms of the choices that we make and the beliefs that we have. And there was one um, dispatch that we had used. I forgot for what footstep it was. It was, I think, it was about Joseph, and the father was in a wheelchair, and he was a camel butcher, and he was doing everything that he could for his family, and his the mother didn't want to be on camera. And one of the things that came out is how, how they were so worried about their teenage son making the right decisions. And so that, that we use that to kind of say, you know, those parents are no different than the parents that you have. So it's not, I, I guess I look at the whole out of Eden learn experience not so much as how do I make it fit the English curriculum, but how can I get you to be a better, a better thinker? How can I get you to start judging and evaluating and finding your own little place. Because if they're not thinking, they're not going to be good readers and they're not going to be good writers. So I want to hit that first. I'm um, with you there. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, I don't know if Liz is going to be able to rejoin us. Um, <laughs> if you are listening, Liz, um, we really appreciate your contribution here. Um, Tabitha, you have anything you'd like to add? Here. Um, you can just leave this open here. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> yeah, I know, I'm. I'm just excited about starting this again. I mean, to mm -hmm. um, just try out the new things that they have, and uh, just being able to connect with teachers because, I mean, that's one of the the great things about this. That teachers are so innovative and creative that it's wonderful to share these ideas, and it just it makes the whole experience for students in our classroom so much better. So, um, mm -hmm. I'm looking forward to learning, you know, more with all of you. So. Does anybody know anything about the security issues that he's facing right now? That, that mm -hmm. was funny to hear I about. I know he was thinking about he had to reroute where he was headed, but as Liz said, they're not going to give it up, which I think is quick. That's a little secretive angle that I could lure my kids into it a little bit more. Yeah, I mean, he's in a hot part of the world, certainly, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> although it's hard not to be. But, right. Mm. And, and, you know, I, Chris Lone, who was mentioned earlier in Salt Lake City, mm -hmm. uh, one of the things he has kids do is um, just kind of look at the whole journey and find something there that they find interesting. So I was thinking that that might be a way to kind of jump on to, uh, you know, you could start looking at a particular country that he has already passed through and, and use that as a jumping off point. So, Liz, did you make it back? Oh gosh, I can't believe tonight's the night my internet conks out, but I've rebooted everything. <laughs> I've moved right next to the server. <laughs> um, so yes, I did a monologue to myself for a bit, and then I, I realized nobody else could hear me. <laughs> it was great. Thank you. <laughs> No, no. So, oh, yes, I'm, this means that yeah, I'm sure you've had very interesting thoughts that I'll have to watch later to find out what they were. We had a few, but one of the ones I said is that, and I don't know if this is exactly where we were, but I really like how you guys have, and I don't know who the guy, the, the people are involved, but you've kind of clarified the curriculum and the three different sections is really useful, and it seems like you've really listened to people and, you know. And it looks like an exciting start. When is it actually supposed to start? I mean, or was it already? Yeah, no. <laughs> well, it's it supposed <laughs> to be starting. And actually, when I get off this uh, this Google Plus Hangout on air, I'm hoping to get launching some parties tonight. Um, we, we've been we've had this slight dilemma in that we knew that some other non-US schools were in the process of signing up and because we find that allocating the walking parties is quite intricate and interconnected we were kind of just trying to buy ourselves a few more days um, because there are going to be some particularly at the middle school um, level uh, where you know they're not as diverse as we would want but I think I'm getting a lot of emails people are eager to start I think what we're going to do is make slightly smaller groups and then hope to add in like schools, for example, from China next week, um, just so people can get up and running. Because you know the school year has started in the US, yeah. people want to get going, and so I think uh, yeah, we just we had a team meeting this afternoon and <laughs> decided we'll just launch and do and um, and you know hope people are understanding that you know we will add in. Um, 
make them more geographically diverse as we're able to. Um, people sign the, up. the other thing that uh, Tabitha touched on, and I think um, Jennifer too, is, um, is how wonderful it is to have community and tools for us to talk to each other and so forth. Mm -hmm. So. It's yes, and that's actually another new feature. Mm -hmm. um, I think the Google, the Google Plus Hangouts that we actually ran were, were, were pretty successful, and we're going to do those again, and there's the forum. But more immediately, we want to create teacher community within the walking parties. And before, you know, you had to take the initiative a bit yourself and kind of do it. Um, and also, we were with the privacy concerns. There was all this, you know. You, we kind of were a bit late get connecting teachers. I think we've learned from that mistake. Um, and so we now have a connect button within the walking parties where educators can just communicate amongst themselves through a, a kind of a, th a thread on there, um, and kind of really get to know one another without the the kids reading everything that they're saying and talking about their plans and what have you. Mm -hmm. So again, we listen to what people had to say, and and, and I think we've also realised that. First and foremost, these these online communities are successful if you've got educator energy and exchange, and people are motivated to come in there and exchange ideas and learn from one another. Mm -hmm. And I think in the first round, we would put kind of a lot more energy into what exactly the kids would be doing and what our curriculum was. And so, you know, this has been a learning process for us as we try to build out the community, um, mm -hmm. I think. My own opinion is my last thought tonight, and we'll hear from others, is that um, that's all really important. The other thing that's important is content, right? And certainly there's the content here is amazing. So, yeah, community and content is a nice thing. Oh, yeah, 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 no, yeah. So, so don't yeah. get me wrong. I maybe wouldn't have done it backwards. I mean, you've got to have something that's worth people coming together around. And yeah. before we set out, frankly, we knew that Paul was a famous journalist, and we really liked him. But it wasn't until he got going and started writing that we really saw what phenomenal material we had <laughs> at our fingertips. Mm. Um, so mm. that, that's exceeded our expectation going in, I think. Um, and moving forward, Paul is actually eager to engage more in our learning community. Um, I think, you know, the first year or two of the project, he was getting to know us. He had really, it's a very difficult task. He's, he he walks when he's up and walking. You know, 20, 25 miles a day in adverse conditions. He's coming back. You know, writing these amazing dispatches. But I think um, he's reaching a point now in his journey where he really wants to engage more with us as well. And so we're excited to to um, to find ways to make that contact more immediate. Um, just as an example, one of the footsteps asks kids to research ahead of time where Paul's going, and then he's going to kind of take on that information and maybe alter his journey and write about things that kids are telling him um, wow. are interesting. That's so interesting. That yeah, mm. that's really interesting. They could even like e either predict or think about where he's going next, right? Is that the notion, or? Yeah, they, they could do that. I mean, obviously, our number one concern, especially with the news going on around the world, is Paul's yeah. safety. So clearly, yeah. there's a limit to how much can be steered by you know kids and yeah. schools around the world. But no, they could definitely could build in with. But that's something they should pay attention to. <laughs> like, don't go there. This, you know. But yeah, right. Yeah. Um, so, um, so that's something yeah. that we're. Ex you know, that's a new feature again this fall where. Um, Really inviting kids to help shape the walk itself and have it be a more, um, you know, um, a dialogue between out of Eden Learn and out of Eden Walk. Yeah. Cool. We should give each other a break. Um, Thomas, any last thoughts? Um, no, it sounds it sounds wonderful. I put some uh, resources for your history teacher in the. Uh, oh, chat. thank you. Okay. So, um, but uh, it sounds wonderful, and I look forward to connecting. Uh, at least our fourth grade as soon as possible, and so we'll be in touch. Yeah, well, you should cite anybody who's watching. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, if you go to our website, and how do we get that out to people? I guess I'll post it underneath um, this. Oh. This. Uh, will you send I'll put that it out, out under the under the video, and then eventually out. Yeah, go ahead. Great, great. So, um, but say it in case somebody's on their bike listening right now. Uh, which, because that's yeah, important. so it's learn, L E A R N, dot out of Eden walk, all one kind of word, um, dot com. I think that's right. I hope yeah. that's right. I yes. think it's right. <laughs> um, yeah. You can find it. 
Google, just, you'll uh, find just it. Just Google Out of Learn. We've got Instagram, Facebook, um, Twitter. You know, we're out there. So, it is um, important to get the word learn in there when you Google it. So, yeah, you get that. Yes, um, yes, it is. Out of Eden Learn. Yeah. So, Great. Jennifer and Tabitha, unless you have anything else to add, uh, do you have? Jennifer, you want to say anything? As no, we're I mean, here? I guess. Great. Like I said before, I'm just so excited to get the new footsteps going. I have a senior leader in my class who went through um, Out of Eat and Learn last year, so she's so eager to come in because she kind of saw the glitches and what she got stuck at, and she's like, can I talk about this, can I talk about that? I'm like, Brittany, you have full reign of everything. Like, Get those kids involved and get them excited. So I'm, I'm excited to have her at least in one of my classes to help guide through it. Great. Great, Great to meet you. And Tabitha, yeah. you want to close this out here? <laughs> yeah, no, I'm excited too to get the um, new fifth grade classes um, going with this. So they're gonna, it's gonna be fun. Cool. Yeah. Um, and me too. Um, my kids might be reading at the fifth grade level, but they are um, six and seven graders, <laughs> so they will be joining you as well. Um, All right. So. Um, Thank you for joining us tonight. We're here every Wednesday night. Um, we do this um, at, uh, as a channel of the World Bridges Network. Um, we are um, on edtechtalk.com. Um, and uh, Jeff Lebo and Dave Cormier started that up eight or nine years ago now. Thank you all for joining us tonight, and we'll be in touch. Great. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.